Okay, so I've got this question like a bajillion times in the past 24 hours. So I'll take a hot second, even though I feel like burning down the world to explain it. So pasteurization versus sterilization. Pasteurization is generally defined as cooking something, steaming something, uh, basically heating something up to a specific temperature and holding that temperature for a specified amount of time. Now, generally speaking, uh, people understand pasteurization as between 160 degrees Fahrenheit and 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And the reason why you do this for pasteurization is so, number one, you save cost uh, versus sterilization. Number two, there's sort of this thought that if you pasteurize something, you'll kill off enough of the bad stuff and you'll, and you'll keep beneficial bacteria. That's all great. Let's talk about sterilization. Sterilization is the application of higher temperatures, generally speaking, above 200 degrees Fahrenheit, applied for a specified amount of time to sterilize something. And to sterilize something, you are killing off all life, beneficial, uh, non-beneficial, so on and so forth. You're killing off everything, right? Your goal is to render it with sterilization. Your goal is to render something inert. Okay, now that we've got definitions out of the way, let's talk about substrate. I sterilize everything. I sterilize my grains, I sterilize my auger, I sterilize my LC. I sterilize my master's mix blocks. Master's mix are for wood lovers and they're sawdust and soy husks. Why do I sterilize those? Because the nitrogen content of soy husks is so high that it's, it, it's very, very, very common that if you pasteurize uh, master's mix blocks, they'll actually go foul, right? Because there are uh, there's so much nitrogen that uh, competing organisms can take hold. All right, so I sterilized my master's mix. Let's talk about our CVGL blend. So a CVGL blend is based off of cocoa core, which is inert and generally clean. Um, vermiculite, which is inert, generally clean. Uh, gypsum, inert, generally clean. Uh, lime to fix it, generally clean. Uh, and we add coffee grounds, which have been spent, and so those have just generally been pasteurized. Now, common wisdom in the community would say that, okay, if you put all of that stuff in at the right ratios, and then you pasteurize it um, for a bit, then you can go off to the races. Here's the problem with pasteurization. Number one, it's not consistent. In other words, if you pasteurize something, there's a lot of variability. There's moisture variability, there's content variability, there's nutrition variability, right? There's size variability. Then, if you're using a manure-based substrate, in other words, horse poops on the thing, it's composted and shipped out, right? You need to pasteurize that. You cannot sterilize that type of dung-based substrate. Why? Because if you've got a great big piece of shit, like a great big turd next to a bunch of wood chips, that's not very bioavailable. It's not broken down. It's going to take a lot of time for the fungus to like really take hold and break that stuff down and make it bioavailable. So you need beneficial bacteria to help accelerate that process and keep contamination down. That's why you pasteurize manure-based substrates that's also why you can get away with just pasteurizing a plain CVGL blend, right? In theory, there's not a lot in there in a CVG blend, so you don't need to sterilize it. And in the case of a newer base substrate, you want to have the beneficial bacteria. Now, let's zero out everything and let's talk about gardening. Let's talk about gardening. More importantly, let's talk about say cannabis growing or small delicate seedling growing. Hundreds of years ago, people kind of figured out that you want to pasteurize your soil, even on your farm, right? You, the, you've got to clean your soil because otherwise, you know, seeds can't take hold. Cannabis growers realized a long time ago 
that to give their uh, cannabis plants the best uh, start, you can use a living soil blend, but that's really based off of cocoa, perlite, gypsum, uh, bone meal, uh, worm castings, bat guano, things like that. Now, a living soil blend is basically an inert and sterilized soil blend. And that soil blend contains everything that you'd find in a composted manure blend, except it is bioavailable, generally speaking, it, depending on what ingredients you use. It is more bioavailable. Number two, all of the things that you're using, like those up there, are going to generally be freeze dried and sterilized. How can we get away with this? Well, as cannabis growers and uh, gardeners realized a long time ago, the mycorrhizal bacteria and fungal relationships, etc., will actually happen naturally given the proper conditions. In other words, if I were to take a sterilized bag of CBGL uh, substrate and mix in some grain spawn and uh, fungus, uh, and then I would, and then I expose that to the open air. Bacteria will naturally form and grow. Like there's going to be chemical reactions, there's enzymes, there's all sorts of stuff, right? It's a primordial soup, right? Cannabis growers realize that they can also sprinkle in additives, right? Basically beneficial bacteria in powder form. And that triggers and activates the, that mycorrhizal mat. What's this all to say for mushroom growers? So, if you're growing mushrooms, there are two things, or there are a couple of things you need to think about. Contamination. Where does contamination come from? It comes from everywhere. We all have bad days. We all make mistakes. Shit happens, number one. Number two, as a mushroom farmer, I need to scale, right? If I'm growing one bag, I'm growing a thousand bags. If I'm growing one tub, I'm growing a thousand tubs. That means I need to have complete and total consistency like I have to have as little variability as I humanly can so what does that mean if we take pasteurization we say hey in our case we're using a CVGL blend that has coffee grounds for nitrogen or we're using a living soil blend that it's got other things that have been freeze-dried and they're natural they're organic and we've sterilized that then what that means is I can rely off of my product. So the substrate is sterilized. There's no variability. The casing layer is sterilized. There's no variability. And the grain spawn is sterilized and there's no variability, right? That means I can go over there to the shelf. I can grab a bag and I know what's in it. I know that it's a 444 or a 666 NPK blend. I know that it's a CBGL that's roughly 30% cocoa pour, 20% perlite, uh, vermiculite, you know, so on and so forth. But more importantly, I know what variables I'm working with. And so that's the key, and that's why I sterilize everything. Now, people are gonna argue with me. So, laboratories and medical healthcare providers have been doing low pressure steam sterilization for decades. Why? There are certain things that you need to sterilize in a lab, plastics, chemicals, etc., that will either combust or carbonize under very mild conditions, right? So you can't pressure cook everything. So that brings us to low pressure steam sterilization. This is Behemoth. You may recognize Behemoth from the Myers mushroom design, the Bubba Barrel uh, substrate steamer, etc. Now, these are commonly understood to be sterilizers or pasteurizers, depending on what your definition of each is. The long story short is that the base design uses environmental steam, right? That means water, if you're not on a mountain like me, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, which is roughly one PSI in temperature. So what these do is they set, um, they have a little hot water heater there in the bottom. They've got a bunch of holes in the top in the normal design, that's not mine. Um, in the normal design, they let steam blow off, etc., and you steam that substrate for a given period of time. Um, 
if you do it for a couple of hours, if you do it like six or eight, it's basically pasteurized. If you do it longer, it's sterilized. Why? If you cook something at 212 degrees Fahrenheit for 48 hours, everything in there is dead. Endospores, whatever you want to make up. Why? Because over the period of time that this hit temp, right, it hit 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Over that 48 hours, that steam and that heat has basically eroded the cell walls of everything, right? All the bacteria, right? You know, it's it's like a suit of armor, right? <laughs> and the endospores, endospores have a little, like endospores, uh, have little things of armor, right? And uh, over time, if you hit that armor enough, it's gonna go away, right? We can do this with much shorter intervals with a pressure cooker. We can't do that with a steamer. Now, let's talk about the behemoth design. I've talked about this before. I took the basic steamer design, right, of, Byer, of Myers and Bubba Barrels, and I said, number one, I'm on a mountain. So water boils at 202 degrees Fahrenheit, which sucks. I want at least one PSI. Second, what I said was, a normal steel food grade barrel should in theory be able to hold about 10 PSI, right? So therefore, there is no logical reason why a quote unquote steam pasteurizer or whatever you wanna argue about uh, cannot be a large autoclave or a large sterilizer. So that's where the pressure stuff comes into play. Now what I have is I'm on a mountain this water is boiling at 202 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So the temperature of this barrel should not be above 202 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm on a mountain. Well, what did I do? I sealed the lid. I added gasket stuff to the rim, right? So it basically made it airtight. Then I added a pressure valve, a uh, pressure gauge and a pressure valve. Now that's an adjustable pressure valve. And you can see I've got it set to about 10 PSI. All of that said, that means this barrel is now under a couple PSI ambient pressure. That means the temperature is now up to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm not pasteurizing anything. Why? Because I'm running that for 24 hours. 24 hours at around five PSI, uh, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, roughly, it's dead. I know because the first time I ran the barrel, I made a test bag. And this test bag has been sitting here since we first ran the barrel. 316, March 16th, we ran the barrel for the first time. No mold, no nothing. Extremely high in nitrogen. Anyways, that's what's going on. <laughs>